Welcome to Spy Satellites, a podcast about Dune Imperium and the people who play it. I'm your host, CJ, and in this, our inaugural episode, we'll talk about everything Immortality, the brand spanking new Just in Player's Hands second expansion to Dune Imperium. So join us for a roundtable discussion focusing on cards, combos, atomics, and everything spice. Before we get down to it, if you like what we do, please give us a like and subscribe, tell your friends, and tell us how we're doing. We're always trying to improve the quality of our content, and we can't do it without you. And now, I'm not orbiting Arrakis alone. I am joined by four wonderful human beings, or I hope they're wonderful human beings. First, of course, we have the horror game junkie, our innovative administrator, the Black Shadow. I think it was, what was it, Ineffable? I think it was you called me. I, I, I did call you Ineffable, yes. Was, you, yeah, I, can ineffable. Rever- I can undo that if you'd like. <laughs> I, it's, I, I've been called significantly worse over the course of my years. Ineffable is a very kind thing to say to somebody. Yeah, I, I, it could be worse. So, yes, hello, everyone. Uh, I will apologize in advance if at any point I seem to slur or ramble on. This is my second podcast of the night in the space of about five hours. It is nearly four in the morning. It's been that kind of week. <laughs> Gas is a little low in the tank, yeah. Having on with, with the tournament and just everything else going on is what it is. So I will try and be as concise as I can, but I may also need running in from time. With us is also the honorary member of Ariana's Spice Addict Posse, the multivariate. Patience is a virtue. Hey, hey. Thanks for having me. Where do you come up with all these names? <laughs> <laughs> You've been at work. <laughs> We're also pleased to have with us the newest member of the Romber fan club and one whose videos are so slick that you'll fall right out of your chair while watching them, the incredible Orski. What's up? Thanks for having me. I'm really glad you can make it. Um, I know you've been doing a lot of work on your end, and I just watched a bunch of your videos, um, and I'm just blown away by how much work you put into them, so thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. I'm getting really excited for your your brand new World Series of Board Games um, quest yeah, well, brand new. A little bit up. started a little while ago, didn't it? But it's bit it's, of a relaunch. <laughs> it's fully in. Yeah, I think it's fully going right now. So uh, do check out uh, his yeah. channel, or see there will be a link below in the description. Um, and last but not least, we have the angriest of ornithopters, the joeist of all helicopter joes, the combat specialist extraordinaire, okay. Lannister. Glad to have you. Hey, glad to be a part of the party. I'm actually happy to hear Orski's a, a Romber fan because. I'm now a Romber main. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to hear. Yeah, you've been playing a lot of Romber, so. Hell yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, so today we're talking all about the newest expansion to Imperium, Immortality. Uh, in Rise of Ix, the first expansion, we got the Ixians and their almost thinking machines. Now we have the Tleilaxu. Immortality axes, uh, introduces, excuse me, the Bene Tleilaxu, who are an isolationist culture who perform genetical modifications and experiments using spice. They're known for their golas, regrown specimens of humans, essentially clones that have been given implanted memories. They're also known for their face dancers, which are a warrior class capable of altering their physical appearance to copy others and perform general espionage or become planted agents in position of authority. And they're also known for their religious fervor, to the point that they worship the giant sandworms of Arrakis and saw the mutated Leto II from God Emperor of Dune, son of Paul Atreides, as their god's messenger. The secrets of their technologies are known only to the few Tleilaxu masters who kind of look like short humans. So, let me turn this over to y'all. Welcome, welcome to the podcast. Uh, We're going to be talking about immortality, and I know we've had this game in our hands for a couple weeks now. But I wanted to turn it over to you and uh, start. Let's let's start with Orski. Um, tell us a little bit about how many games you played so far. What's your experience with uh, Immortality? Okay, yeah. So I have about three games in. I played two with you guys. Um, I think it was on Monday <laughs> yep. when we uh, originally tried to record the podcast, and yeah, had a lot of fun. I also played a stream game as well. Yeah, how did that go? Um, initial... I, I missed that one. I, I I caught part of it, and then I didn't get the end of it. It went really well. I ended up uh, winning the game, which, you know, always feels good when you're you're playing live or whatever. But I had a lot of fun with it. And as far as first impressions go, 
I will say I really like the um, the fact that they added a new row to buy cards. I think it'll make it way more likely that obviously we see all the new cards there because it's obviously going to take a lot more time to see the new cards when they're mixed into such a large uh, Imperium row now. So it's nice to get a, a more concentrated peek at these uh, the new cards. I haven't felt like the the research track has been too impactful so far. Obviously, I'm only three games in, mm-hmm. um, but we shall see. Although, I guess, um, in a way, it did help me in the last game, so we'll see. And then, lastly, the I think the other big thing that kind of has made an impression on me is the fact that the game has an extra victory point now, so the games do tend to drag a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I still think it's possible to rush the game. We'll see how much of a, a meta-defining thing that is in uh, immortality, but I'm excited that deck building is obviously a bigger concern of the developers, and hopefully that will uh, shine through as we continue to explore this immortality meta. Black Shadow, did you have any thoughts? You want to jump in here and tell us about your experience so far? Yeah, so before we get on, on I don't expect Paul Denon to respond to this, but I'm pretty sure in the rules uh, of this extra point, for those groups, especially veteran and tournament players, I mean, I'm just saying. It's fine. We, we understand. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so yeah, but obviously we've played, we've tried to play as much um, Immortality as we can. We obviously went and did the in-depth video, Orski did his one, his reactions. I did one with more of a general game concept and theory introduction to all the players. I haven't been able to play as much of it as perhaps I would have liked. There's been other things I've been having to sort out, as you can understand. Um, but I've definitely enjoyed uh, a lot of what I've seen so far. Uh, I have talked about the fact that I think Immortality, just as a general game, suits me more. Uh, my style. Uh, I have talked before about Rise of Ix, um, and that, you know, sometimes I do kind of wish it is that, you know, I accept that shipping is a big driver of the action, but I'm okay with the fact that, that that's the case, but I've always tried to strive in Ix games to kind of explore different ways of playing the game or, you know, do myself outgoing shipping. I've usually lost those games, but it's fine. It's set me in good stead for Immortality as it's turned out, because now there is so many more different things to do between research and grafting and whatnot. Um, you know, and there's a lot to like. I think it's not necessary for every single person. And I think a lot of people are going to be used to X and the fact that there is so much more extra stuff being added on if you're playing both expansions. There, there's a lot to get your head around and there's only so much you can track of humanely. But um, I've definitely enjoyed my time of it so far. I'm curious to see how the game kind of pans out with a little bit more play in every people's hands. Um, and yes, there will be an immortality tournament eventually. Don't worry about it, kids. Yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, and for for many of you who uh, maybe are just getting the game now or have, have just heard about it, there's, there are a couple of things that we should mention about what has changed. So um, you probably can check out uh, Black Shadow's video on this on this channel about exactly what's going on. But Be just yeah, just a nice primer for that, and also Orski's video going through all the new stuff and the cards. Um, but just as a refresher, there is a brand new Tleilaxu board which adds um, two new victory points if you uh, acquire what these like scarab beetles. Is that what we're calling them? There's, the... uh, well, scarab beetles is technically renaming it twice. I think they're just scarabs. Like scarabs, they sure. Officially. Yeah. And uh, there's also a research track that is tied to a new card that goes into your deck called the, uh, was it, I think it's, re- what is it called? The um, experimentation. 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 And when you play the card as an agent action, it actually allows you to move along the board and you choose um, which path to go from left to right. And you can never go backwards. And so you're accumulating these um, bonuses and a lot of them are specimens, which is a new resource that is um, housed on that board. And then you can use those resources to buy the next cool thing that is added by this expansion the Tleilaxu cards, right, which have a cost of from one to four specimens. And during your re- your reveal turn, you can buy those and put them into your deck. Or if you're a certain space uh, along the research track, you can put them on top of your deck, right, as, as opposed to your discard pile as usual. So those are the kind of new things that go on with the, with the game. Um, there's one more thing I should mention is that the Research station has been modified so that it no longer draws you three cards. It draws you two cards, and it also gives you a research icon. Oh, and I missed one thing. Would you like to cover what that is? Uh, would anyone like to cover what the last thing I missed here is? Does anyone remember? Yeah, I'll do that. That's a great segue for me. The family atomics uh, is the other big thing. So once a game, you can nuke the Imperium row, not 
the um, the new Benny Tlaxu row, which is two cards, which you purchase with your specimens. Um, but but the Imperium row, the five card row, and it's at first I was quite skeptical about it. I was one of the X players who really liked the games that got where the row got bogged down and you just had to make do and strategies shifted and somebody may have to break the dam of weak cards or whatever. Um, I liked those games actually, but so I was really skeptical about the atomics, but I'm completely converted. Mm -hmm. Like, and specifically, I think because you can play them anytime. So they're super dynamic. You can play them at the start of your turn if you just want to have a fresh set of five cards to look at. You can play them at the end of your turn if you took what you want and you want to den deny others. You can play them in the middle of the round when you're not drawing anything, when you just want to make sure Helena doesn't get to play her ring on something. Like It's very, very dynamic. And But the fact that you only get to play it, use it once is limits it. It's not like it takes over the whole game. I really, really like it. I think it makes the deck building so much more interesting and is a whole mini strategy game in and of itself. Maybe before I move on to my other thoughts, we should all, like, if people want to jump in on that. Um, I'll, I'll actually we'll, we'll come uh, back. Hold, before we get into that, I would say, like, I know a lot of people have thoughts on that. I want to save that for a little bit later. So I want, I want to go through everyone first and we'll come back to the atomics because i know i have a lot of thoughts on that too but we haven't finished introducing everyone's initial impressions so we'll get through that sure um, right. I'll, I'll keep the rest of mine quick then i'll just say that what i i, I loved the x expansion still love it um i thought that like many people the the center of gravity being the shipping track was both a strength and a weakness. It's very dynamic. Lots of cool things can happen around the shipping track, mm -hmm. but it also just pulls everybody towards it, but not necessarily. You can still win without it, obviously, in X, and there's lots of other strategies. I just think that with um, the this new Immortality expansion, it's like that center of gravity of the shipping track is still there, but it's like stretched out or pulled a little bit further. There are more options, especially the research track and the the beetle track that goes with it the benny flylaxu track um there are other options for points but it's not like shipping has become less important i really find it fascinating mm -hmm. like the depths of strategy to edit a game and the other key edit that you mentioned earlier cj around now research station until you get to the end of the research track only giving you two cards and a research bump like that is also a little tweak that takes that center of gravity, which was almost like an automatic spice must flow when you went there for those three cards. And now that's slightly nerfed, but it's still important. It's like, again, it kind of tweaked it, stretched it a bit. It's still a center of gravity for cards, but not the like all consuming thing that it was in X. All that added up. I'm just, I'm floored by immortality after about 40 or 50 games now. Like I, I think it's just like I've played a few X games lately because there's an X tournament coming up, and I mean I still like it, but it's pretty ho hum compared to Immortality. Do you you find you you find it like lacking now that you've had the taste of Immortality? Oh, it's just it's just so much. It's there's just so much less going like there's just less going on. There's That's less dynamism. I'm not saying it's a bad game. It's still a great game. It's just Immortality it adds another layer of possibilities and and. I think it's just really well done too. I think it's quite tight. Fascinating, Lannister. I didn't mean to cut you off there for a minute. Let, let's uh, tell everyone how your experience with the game is going. How many games do you have, and and so on. Um. So, as of now, I've got about two hundred games going. It's a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how much I love the game. I I, I play regularly with a, a bunch of you guys, uh, from beginners to veterans. So. Anytime you guys are free to play, just give me a shout. But uh, by and large, I have to, I have to agree with Orski on that. It's a, uh, it's really nice having that uh, extra, you could say Imperium row with the Talaxu cards. It's really amazing. I, I love, I love the deck options, and to that end, the uh, the variant, that's amazing. Like I love deck building. So, to me, when you have that uh, zero VP instead of the one VP start. It's a lot of deck mm. building that goes on with it. I, I love mm. it so much. It's just mind blowing the possibilities. Because back then, when you're playing as Ecas, you're you're playing catch up, and it's it's a tough it's a tough break sometimes going with that. So 
And, and what I, you're referring I, to, sorry, what we're referring to is the um, the recommendation to remove the one point from the four player games, right? And so we start at zero, where that's the recommendation by the designers now, so that the game goes a slightly longer, and that's to counterbalance what we suspect is the added v- VP from the Tlaxu track. Am I right on that? Yep, you got it. That's correct. Um, so going back to that, uh, I love the research track too. Um, in that in that aspect, me and Orski kind of have a different perspective. I think the research track has a, a lot of good variations to it. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, those variations could even go uh, so much as to give you the resources necessary to complete certain objectives. Mm-hmm. Uh, so mm-hmm. I'll, I'll go deeper into that when we talk about combinations and stuff like that. But yeah. uh, there's definitely a lot of... Uh, sick combos as uh as patients talked about and I'm, I'm really loving it so far yeah um and i will go now the i've had about 25 games so not even nearly as many as as patients or you lannister i've only played a paltry amount but i'd say like i i really do enjoy it i have a lot of things that i want to talk about about it like i am always a critical person when it comes to games some of my favorite games feel like very tight economic um, difficult choices, dynamic choices, things like that. I love Ix and I love the original Dune Imperium. I like Immortality. There's some things I don't like about it. Um, we'll get to that in just a minute, but what I want to say about it is I think it is a very, very good step forward in the uh, development, I guess you could say, or the evolution of this game. I guess evolution is an apt term because that's kind of maybe mutating maybe mutation is the better word um uh you know you're mutating this game into something slightly different its focus is slightly change but overall it still retains that central core of deck building worker placement tight worker placement spaces um you know uh resources are hard to come by um points are really hard to grab you know that all feels the same so so the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, there are a couple things we've all talked about that we like and a couple of things that we might want to touch on a little bit more. The first thing I wanted to touch on is your experience. I know patients you have very strongly opinionated about this is Family Atomics. Uh, family Atomics is an addition, as you mentioned, that you can wipe the Imperium row. Uh, and when you do so, you draw five new cards. So it kind of helps out if you felt that the base game uh, didn't let you see enough cards, right? And you felt like maybe, you know, there's so many cards in this deck, why am I only seeing 30 or so throughout the game? And and so to that, to that point, uh, Atomics does kind of accelerate the game. Um, is everybody as positive on it as, as patience? Like, I'm kind of mixed on it, honestly. And you stop saying atomics. I feel like I'm going to throw up every time you say that. Platomics. <laughs> uh, so for me personally, I, I uh, the games I've had with atomics, it's been it's like a gacha style type of game. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it takes a lot of the skill away in in terms of uh, you just gambling for the high roll card. So uh, a lot of what we do, uh, including myself, so I'm not uh, I'm not any different than the rest of the gang. We basically aim for, say, still suits, and then we just hit research, and then we have six or more to buy, and we just blow up the row and buy the master, and it's pretty much game over at that point, or whatever else you, you go there and go. So I feel like in that element, it really takes away a lot of the skill elements. Um, I, I can go into combinations later on, but uh, we'll, we'll let other people say their opinions on that first. Anyone want to jump in? Uh, well, so I'm I'm pretty new to the expansion, so I don't think I've gotten to the point where um, I'm like rolling for certain cards. In this case, the Tlaxu Master. Um, I really like the Atomic Change so far. Um, one thing is, I think whenever a board game adds more ways to interact with the other players, I think that can generally be seen as a positive thing. And additionally, it gives you a little bit more agency over what you're seeing in the row and. I know sometimes um, it can be a complaint like, oh, yeah, someone got Lady Jessica or someone got Quizats, and you kind of just sit by helplessly because if they have the um, influence to pay for it and you can't get it from before them or use the Hell in a Ring to take it out of the row, then there's really nothing you can do. And I think this gives other players a way to interact with that. 
And additionally, um, if you're getting upset because someone's nuking away the car that you just went to the research station to save up for, and now the row sucks, if your potential counterplay could have been saving your atomics so you can refresh the row as well. I don't, I haven't fully explored the dynamic yet, but from the games I've played, I've, I've really enjoyed the atomics edition. Cool. Yeah, this is something that I, I touched on in the in-depth vid. Um, because I knew it was something that was going to come up, and as people get more accustomed to mortality, I think the use of atomics is going to change a bit more. You know, I think early on it's easy just to you know get up a load of persuasion, hit the row, and kind of hope you kind of high roll into something good. But there is more and more going on, I think, gradually of using the row as a way to kind of strategically get rid of certain cars of certain people. Um, which I don't know how sustainable that is in the long run, because as I mentioned in the video. If you build up eight persuasion for a hand and someone hits the row before you and takes it out, you've still got eight persuasion. There's still so many cards you can get that are going to be really strong for you. So um, it's also difficult for me as well because I never particularly cared about games. And I've, I've kind of liked them uh, in X and whatnot, where if you have kind of a quiet row, you know, if it's full of like Sardaukai High Inventories and, you know, Spice Hunters and whatnot, and there's not a lot going on. Um, I find I think those are quite interesting in a way because people are so used and so desiring of just having like these massive like tons of great cards on the deck and just bangers all over the place that when suddenly they get in a position where there aren't any good cards and you know and they're having to kind of then think well what do I do and people start scrambling to think of a new strategy um, not a lot of people are really used to that situation and you have to think on your feet a lot um, you know and I think especially um, in for some leaders, obviously, I've definitely suited to having particular types of cards coming out. But some of them also, like, are totally fine. If there's not a lot going on the row, you just kind of make do with what you've got. Um, you know, and, and that's still, I think, somewhat the case in Immortality. Mm -hmm. But obviously, people can take out the row now. Um, there's so many good cards between some of the base game cards. Rise of Export, tons of great cards. Um, and there's plenty of good ones as well in Immortality. So it, it's a little difficult for me. Like, it doesn't bother me as much as I know it's bothered some of the people. Uh, potentially um i you know I, I think it's part of the game um i it feels weird so i haven't had a chance to play to immortality without using atomics and it's just not ever happened mm. um i haven't quite gotten that far whether it's better or not is is not for me to judge but uh, you know i think it, it comes down to how you end up using it it comes down i think ultimately to how you decide you're going to apply it um and i also as i did mention in the video um you can't have your cake and eat it with atomics you can't say to me that like you know you get frustrated like someone did uh you know gets frustrated like when it's a really quiet row um and then like when it's a it's a half decent row and they've got a certain lead and they're going for a certain strategy and the person before them takes it out for it they can buy stuff you know you can't have it both ways you've got to accept you know if you're gonna take out rows to get stronger cards then people are going to take out rows to deny those so you've got to be willing to kind of go both ways on that what everybody said makes sense. I think my counter, and part of why I'm such become such a big fan, is I was totally one of the people who loved the constraint of a of a weak Imperium row and how you had to be forced to figure that type of game out strategically. And I'll still love that. I think the reason I've it's not just the dynamism and all the different ways that you can deploy the atomics. Yeah, you can use it to nuke the road to try to roll high and get a card, but you can also use it preventatively. You can use it preventively at different times. And it's, it's just super flexible when you use it and how you use it. Um, and that's, but the other thing is everybody has it once. So there's no real, like nobody's got the advantage and it shouldn't be like, a, it shouldn't be the getting eight, <laughs> eight persuasion in your hand early in the game is something you have to work on. Like that just doesn't ha doesn't just happen. You have to focus on that and make it happen. So I don't see the problem with rewarding that effort and but also it doesn't necessarily get rewarded like you nuke the row and you get a bunch of junk you know like you just you just you know so it can go wrong for you too anyway all that to say the other reason i really like it my other big defense that i didn't mention earlier is because the your the deck building aspect is enhanced not just by the additional available immortality card row the two cards and the i think it's a 19 card deck um it's not just those cards that make like for more options and better deck building in some ways, but it's also really that 10 point game. Um, I think almost all the games of Immortality played have been 10 points and that makes the deck building more meaningful. And so good, have Atomics, build more dynamic and exciting decks um, because the 
Imperium Rose getting churned a bit more. Like I think it makes the game more exciting, frankly. So yeah, I like it. So I, I'm kind of lately on the fence of this. I, I started out really, really disliking Atomics, um, and I'll go into why in a second. But as I played with it, I've kind of like gone, oh, okay, I'll just kind of deal with it. I find I don't use it all that much, and maybe that's my problem. But um, the reason I didn't like, and I still kind of don't like Atomics in general and the concept of it, is because the Imperium row, the Imperium deck, and the Imperium row get filled up with cards um, that are bad. They're bad cards cards that you would otherwise not want to take but sometimes you're forced to take them in order to make something out of nothing you have to take them in order to navigate as you mentioned patients you really like that in x navigate the Imp the imperium row find the combos that work together find a way through to 10 points when you have atomics at least for me what what ha ends up happening is that the cards that um, everyone wants to have get found more frequently and so you end up seeing them more you end up seeing a lot more of the high power cards and you end up ditching the low power cards entirely which to me in the way it sounds is like there's essentially a deck of 25 to 30 cards that are good and the rest of them are duds and people just don't take those they just simply won't take them in fact because of the the Bene Tleilaxu deck now you don't have to take them at all. You can just ignore them and go to the Bene Tleilaxo tech if, if all of the atomics have gone and the, the, the row does stagnate. You, the, the row will never move again. So I find that the whole issue of atomics for me, it exacerbates problems of high power creep cards and that they keep showing up more frequently, which affect games more. And in games where sometimes, you know, in Ix, we'd have like a game like where for instance, one player ends up with um, an In the Shadows uh, and another player ends up with a Web of Power. Well, I end up seeing those cards a lot more when I'm playing Immortality and it makes it less variable to me because I start seeing the same cards over and over again. Um, people will get to like five Persuasion or six Persuasion and blow the row and just like RNG into something decent. And the rest of the cards will just sit there and do nothing and they'll always pick the same kinds of cards. So. I, I, I'm i of a kind of... I, I don't really like it. I'm straight up going to say I, I think it's um, it's fine. It's kind of fun to do. But I think it actually hurts the replayability of the game in a way because of it, it, sh it sort of shrinks the deck down to the most powerful um, busted cards that you want to play. The cool ones that, you know, when you do get them, you feel really powerful. Now you see those cards every time and it just feels a little bit less special. Um so that's how I feel about that. So <clears throat> from my experience, I'd say uh, there's approximately 30 new cards, roughly, of which maybe three of them are over the cost of five. So when you blow the row, really all you need is five persuasion. Five persuasion is all you need. And master being one of the major problems, two copies of it. And uh, other various uh, five cost cards are also very strong. So. I won't get into the whole spiel of it, but uh, five is the sweet number that we found in the community that we played around. And I, I have to say, like, there's so many busted combos with just five, and it's a very easy achievement to hit five on just skill suits and and uh, the research. And it becomes very difficult to combat that. A, a lot of the times, uh, for example, even if I have just five on reveal and masters out there, I've had 17 games so far where I open revealed first turn, no actions with master on board. And I won 14 of them, 14 of the 17 off of no actions, just open reveal, not even including anything else. That's how busted that card is. And other, other cards as well, but the five is that sweet number. And I find that, if you interact with that card or other uh, five card costs that are uh, new to the uh, to the game, you'll find that that is pretty much the sweet number that is around it. And seven and eight is not as relevant as it's supposed to be. I'd say it's it's a tricky one. Um, I'll quickly throw in here. I think that we'll talk about uh, Master a bit more in more detail. I think it's an example here that the fact with all the expansions together, you've got 135 cards now in the Imperium Row 
plus about 20 different Tylaxu cards going on. So that's, that's a ton of cards. Maybe that this is also serving like a side kind of real brutal pro, um, sort of process of just trying to make sure as a developer more of these cards are turning up every game. Because if you didn't have Atomics, you know, you've got like 130 odd cards. Some, you know, the argument is that some of these cards you're not going to see very often. I think you would get what through maybe, well, you get through probably in an average X game of actual Imperial Road cards, like probably about 30. Like you yeah, about 30, see. I think. That's, that's on average. 25, 30. Sure. So if in theory, so if you have that in, um, in uh, Immortality and X, that means you're seeing any one card on average every four games. That's yeah. not a lot. You know, and maybe there as a as a designer, um, maybe there's a slight concern about that in that, you know, you've got all these new cards, but you're not actually seeing them very much. I don't know. Um, even if you take the X cards out, there's still one like every three games that you're going to see it, let alone being able to get hold of it. So maybe there's a little bit of that going on, but it is tricky. Um, you know, I, I think on the whole, it's probably I think it's it's pros outweigh the cons. Um, but I think Atomics, what it's also doing is maybe it's kind of uh, exacerbating some of those cons, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, and it's making them more apparent than perhaps they otherwise would be. So, so that's fine. So you you feel like the the pros of Atomics outweigh the cons? Does does anyone else feel that so far that the pros outweigh the cons? Oh, yeah, I've I've clearly argued you, you that. Do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think the one thing that I would add is that Silaxu Master Gola maybe a few other cards, but particularly Twi'laxu Master. Like, I think we're getting confused between a broken card, which no doubt Twi'laxu Master is, I think, the most broken card we've seen in all the Dune Imperium decks. Um, I think we're getting confused between it and a problem with Family Atomics. That's a good point. Um, can I step in here and then I'll let you continue? So... Um, no, that's why I was going to say. Go ahead, yeah, I think I think that's a really really good point. So that's why I'm kind of on the fence here. Is that the games I've played, and I've played several games where I've just we've taken out uh, the problem cards. I think with that, we'll, we'll kind of agree in general that um, a lot of people are kind of maybe confused whether or not Gola or, or unsure whether or not Gola or or Tlaxo Master are just too good uh, in general, like way above the power curve, way above the power curve, and so we just took those out and played the game with that. At Lannister and you and I played a couple of games like that. I think maybe maybe more than two um those games i mean i think we took out uh, out atomics as well but those games felt great they they felt more like dune for me like where it was more methodical you can have a little bit more of a strategy that's another thing i want to mention too is that with atomics and then i'll, I'll turn it back over to you patience i apologize with atomics there's less of an ability as a player to look at the row to look at the tech tiles, to look at everything and evaluate who you should pick as a leader. In fact, I'd say that there it, it shrinks down to maybe 5% of the time I'd do that with Atomics because all the things out there, I can't guarantee they're going to be there at the end of the first round. In fact, I can't guarantee that if someone picks, if I pick Helena, someone's probably going to blow the row anyway just if to stop me from getting like one really powerful card that they think is going to power my engine. Or if you're Ikaz, same kind of thing. Although I think that Ikaz doesn't suffer quite as much because there are a lot more cards on average that are three or less. And I'd say on average, the power level of those cards has gone up with this expansion. So I think you're right. I think that this is these are two separate issues. The one that Atomics is, is, is or is not a fun me mechanism for the game or one that is rewarding um strategic play the way we're kind of used to um for me i'm on the fence and i kind of can give or take whatever i kind of don't like the concept of it i think it kind of goes against what i liked about dune and ix generally um but i can see the argument that it does reward fun interesting strategies and encounter plays and this kind of mini game that i think that that's an apt way of putting it. it's like a, a strategy game within the game patience where you where you decide when to use your one atomics then i'll turn it back over to you no no i think i i've made my case I, i've I, I i the only thing i would wrap up and saying is i was i was really against it conceptually from the outset and have just been experientially sold okay. because it's so much fun basically do you find yourself using it um offensively more or as a way to dig for better cards for yourself more often 
completely situational and that's part of the fun of it is you just never know what you're going to get pushed into like it's and i you know helena I, I that's an interesting point that that cj has made about the, the how atomics uh change the way that you're selecting leaders at the beginning because you can't rely on the cards in the row being there and I think that's challenging. And it's challenging in particular for Helena and Ikaz lovers who like see the card they want to get and want to go get it. And I would say, well, you know, you're still going to get lots of cards to use your ring on over the course of the game. Um, maybe even that's like a bit of a healthy tweak to be able to undermine that, those Helena and Ikaz opening strats. Because it, it can, you know, it can be, a, it can be, it can be a little bit much sometimes, um, especially when one of the cards on the row is uh, shifting allegiances or in the shadows. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I I don't know I I don't but I but I do respect that and I have to think a lot more about those how the Imperium relates to leader selection. I think that's an important point. I definitely I definitely use it defensively, like especially as a as a self prescribed deck builder. You love to build your own deck and. Um, I rarely use it to deny unless it's something really busted. So uh, the, uh, the offensive side of things gives you a lot more possibilities. And I think that's one of the dynamics that changes significantly in the game in that uh, you get to build your deck from ground zero. So this is really fun in one way in, in the sense that you're no longer stuck in a situation where, well, I can't afford anything, so I guess I got to go a different route. You can definitely build your deck from the ground zero straight away, like even as low as three persuasion if you're really desperate, right? But I'd say uh, in that sense, it is great. But in the in the sense of the challenge, as you guys have uh, described, I'd say it, uh, it, does it takes away from that element of challenge where you're like, I got to fight for what I have to build. So, you know, that's my opinion on it. That does kind of mess with the scarcity sort of ethos or, or storyline theme of of dune you know like the mm -hmm. whole game is supposed to be a bit about the whole world is supposed to be a bit about scarcity and atomics is like fundamentally makes things abundant it's a, that's a bit of a contradiction i guess in in the lore so i don't know how many of you are familiar with the lore so in, in the lore all of the um great houses had atomics but they were they they never used them um, out of mutually assured, assured destruction in a sense, um, or be, and because they had a kind of, I can't remember what the name of it is, there's, there's an agreement um, that someone will tell me in the, the chat, I'm sure, or the, the comments below, there's some kind of agreement where they just would not use them out of, you know, a kind of mutual respect, even if they disliked each other like House Harkonnen and the Atreides, they just wouldn't use Atomics because it would lead to, like, an intergalactic problem right so i i find it a little bit um weird the fact that we all have them <laughs> just as a kind of like thematic um here you go i i, I like I, I i so there are a couple things like i like the idea of moving the row along in concept but in practice i find it less satisfying than when i'm having to figure out a plan because I like that puzzle. That's one of the things that drew me to, to Dune in general. Is like, I don't like really fast deck builders. Like, I mean, like the beloved Dominion or things like that. I don't find those very interesting. I know that the people out there will say like, the blasphemy and so on. But I, I, they just don't appeal to me. I just feel like I don't have enough agency. And I don't um, really care if my, my actions are reveal my hand and then do the things. That's not that interesting to me. If I have to choose which action i i pick so it's it feels more methodical in dune and obviously that's the the whole point here so for me the atomics kind of like goes against that methodical nature the planning the strategy and it and it kind of throws a little to a little bit of rng in there where for me personally again like this is my personal view it's just a little too much to to make me enjoy that puzzle anymore. I just don't find it that interesting when I just blow up the row or people are doing that and I can't plan it. So, but that's me. I do wonder um, if it would have been uh, on the cards to maybe associate some kind of fee with using Atomics or some kind of punishment. Maybe you have to pay a spice mm. for it. Yeah. 
maybe then you can plan around other people using it. It's not being used on the first row, so you can plan around it with your leader selection and stuff like that. I think this has been know. muted, but I think the fact you only can do it once and once alone, I think probably should be enough of a price. If you're going to use it that early and kind of spuriously, then when later on, when something kind of bad, you know, someone that you're gearing up for a big review hand and then someone hits the row and you're left with not very much, like that's your own punishment. So I think um, I think it should be fairly kind of self-serving. Yeah, yeah, but don't don't you think that would you agree that the very first card you buy in Dune would be the most important card you buy in Dune? You're going to see it the most throughout the course of the in game. Theory. I mean, so in theory, yeah. so so having a higher value card early on dramatically impacts your overall strategy, your game plan, and the strength of your deck, right? So if you're working through this kind of plan where you have like the chance to hit a five value card early or a six value card or a four value card or whatever and you just you 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 get that the 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 more everyone is getting those things seems to like really really push power level through the decks faster um i mean i don't know and and you people using these early, or early that's all i ever see people using and if they get past like round five or six i don't see them used at all and then sometimes they're used to maybe hit um like a jessica or a, a chome or something like that you know but in, yeah just, just the the yeah. instant uh cards the instant uh, yeah. buy cards but like besides that they're not used late i think they're only used in like the first three or four rounds honestly most of the time I mean, but I feel like this must have been tested. I feel like they must have like played around developing this, with, like having it as a price. And what they probably ended up finding was that people weren't using them particularly early because they've got to pay a cost and they'd rather do stuff. And then by the time they've got the resources to pay for them, you're already at that stage where there's not much point hitting the row anyways because the game's half over. So mm -hmm. they probably found that most people were not actually using Atomics at all. So I don't think associated cost is going to necessarily fix that. Uh, I think it's just going to mean people are just going to... If you charge Solari, they're not going to use it because they want to get Swordmaster. They want to get Mentat, High Council, Dreadnought. If you charge Spies, they want to be hitting Selective Breeding. They want to go to, you know, like Highliner maybe, stuff like that, by text. There's already so many uses for these resources. I think putting a cost for that, I don't necessarily think is going to solve the problem. I think you're just going to end up meaning there's less use for Atomics. Yeah. I, I feel like they must have tried this in, in development. Does anyone else well, have anything to mention about Atomic? So go ahead, Lannister. Well, for me personally, I'd say that uh, you do have a point there, Black Shadow and the cost, but uh, the Atomics can be used for game-changing type of uh, position. So, um, so for example, if you're adding a cost to it, that cost can also add to you uh, getting certain advantages too. So, uh, for example, maybe you're chasing down that Liak Kynes for that extra bump or that Jessica for that extra bump or even something as desperate as... Uh, uh, Lisa and Gaib for that one spice if it's a Solari cost or maybe a, a six spice for the next round, something like that. I'd say for me personally, the problem with the the Atomics is when you hit that research center and you hit that maybe that five or above, you basically cycle back into your deck quicker too. So you have a pretty high chance of hitting that card next round, that power card. And of the 30 or so cards, there's probably six or seven that are five cost or so five um, five or below that are really powerful really strong stuff that can really bend the game outside of Talaxu master mm -hmm. like uh for example still suits manufacturer Talaxu surgeon keys to power interstellar conspiracy benny Talaxu uh, researcher things like that when you cycle back into those cards really quickly it really busts the game up and there's uh, been a good number of games where the game ends on turn six just because of that no that we've been talking a lot about tlaxu master so maybe this should be a good transition to talking about that card i know there have been a lot of opinions in in the discord about this and uh, i know a lot of us share those um so let's just go through what this card does uh and and then we can talk about what it might be a problem with it <laughs> or or maybe there isn't a problem with it so uh, Tleilaxu Master is a five cost Imperium Row card. There are two in the deck and its agent ability is uh, you may, if, if you are in the first um, DNA rung, it's like the fourth row of the research track, you may uh, take a card from the Imperium Row that costs five or less or six or less, six or less. And you just can buy it for free. So that's, that's fine. 
but if you are all the way to the end of the row uh, of the research track rather um, and you've gotten all the way to the end you can put that card directly into your hand that's that's a pretty massive change of that if you can get there right but i'd say we'd, we'd all probably agree that under normal circumstances it's kind of difficult to get all the way around the track it's it's definitely a chore you have to try right now there's another thing that it does is it's a re reveal it reveals for one persuasion and it also reveals for two research icons and the research icons are how you get across the research track and so um and I'll, I'll throw this out to you all but the first thing i want to say about the card is it's interesting it has two research icons but it does seem to me that this card powers itself up <laughs> and then when you get to the end of the track once you've reached the end of the research track um research icons turn into draw a card and so when you reveal with tylaxu master um probably mid game late game if you get it early um it's going to draw you two more cards from your deck and then you're going to immediately reveal them so that's pretty interesting um, what are your all thoughts on that? So I think there's a couple of disclaimers we need to quickly throw in here, um, just so we're on there. So yeah, this has been talked a lot in the TTS uh, Discord, but obviously not everyone listening may not be a part of that. So I think one of the things with a card like Selective Master is that it probably has a lot of different uses depending if you're kind of just playing the game, you know, and having a bit of a mess around. And then people that have played this game and, and doing Imperium, you know, dozens, you know, hundreds of times. Um, and a card like Selective Master... I think is only a card that kind of it means two different things you know if you're just kind of playing generally um it lets you kind of play around with the research track and you can get more progress and that's pretty cool but you're not necessarily maximizing the absolute power that Saxon Master has at the end game um which is like being the, the pure card draw and the fact that I think the self-funding is definitely a thing that's not to say that there aren't some other cards that kind of technically self-fund you know in the shadows technically self-funds because yeah. you reveal it for the Bene Gesserit bumps, and then you can then play it to, you know, build up other decks. Uh, Weber Power is another one. You can reveal it to, um, you know, bust, uh, buff up other, other tracks outside the Bene, of the Bene Gesserit, and then you play the Bene Gesserit to get the full power of it. Um, so there's other examples, but I think it's just the pure potential for this to snowball. Um, you know, get through the research track really quickly, make a rush on Beatles um, to get the Talaxu points, maybe get the Spice early. And then just absolute tons of spice must flows drawing towards the back end. And I think also as the other thing as well is that because you're again drawing these extra cards, it also has the extra benefit of the fact that you're then seeing Taxi Master faster because you're drawing through your deck at a much more hyper rate than you normally would do otherwise. I mean, uh, you know, those those two extra bumps is significant. I mean, that's basically like a free selective breeding every single time you play Taxi Master. That's absolutely enormous when you think of that. With no cost, you know, you're not paying any spice for that. You just get it and you just run for it so, so often. Um, and like when, especially when you've got other things going on as well, where there's already so many strong agent action boxes, uh, there is, you know, it, it exacerbates that as well. Um, now, I think I was talking, about, I think it was patience. It might have been, I might have mistaken, but, you know, perhaps Tax Master is kind of like one of those sort of quick and dirty sort of ways of making sure that people get a lot of use out of one of the new um, components of the game, you know, being research, because you don't have to get to the end of the research track in order to win the game. Far from it, you know, you can do a bit of work on it, but, and there's some very good rewards to have there later on, but it's not, it's not particularly necessary. Um, mm -hmm. But... I think um, going on to so I want to explore more is uh, this Lannister uh, Lannister's um, open revealing stuff, which I think is pretty eye opening. Um, I, I think unfortunately it is just a card that like in the hands of people that know very heavily what they're doing, um, there's nothing to really do to stop it. Uh, once you get it, like you can't stop them revealing it. You can't stop them playing the card. Like you, 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 unless you manage to find a way to get them to discard their entire hand somehow um and then even so they're just going to draw it again and you can't sustainably do that so i think that's um you know that's just where we're at here unfortunately but i do want to handle lousy i'm i'm very fascinated about this open reveal stuff so in in dune i'd say a lot of the times you're deciding between certain things that you can do in the round of like, uh, uh do you want to take some bumps or do you want to go into combat and get some victory points or do you want to buy a spice most flow this card allows you to do everything Mm -hmm. and more so how does that do that so an example here is when you reveal it at the end of the track you're averaging at least four by power one for itself 
another one cost maybe, and another two cost. So you already got four buy power. Pretty much done with the spice must flow. Now, the other uh, applications of it is when you've powered it up, it gives you a lot of resources as well. So extra spice, extra cubes. Those cubes can be used to purchase other things that allow you to draw extra. So uh, an example would be uh, Unrelenting Assault, Telexu Infiltrator, things that basically allow you to draw even more cards. So it's not abnormal for the master to cycle through his entire deck in one rotation. And the combinations that go along with it just allow you to hit the tracks, go into combat, buy must must flow, all that in one shot. And the, the dirtiest thing about that card is you can keep doing it every single round. And uh, it might take a lot more than just a simple explanation. I mean, one of these days in, with hidden assets, maybe we can explore that. But uh, sure. basically, you can hit three objectives all in one go instead of choosing two out of three under normal circumstances. Now, has anybody actually, now this might be slightly off topic, but has anybody managed to get both Tylaxu Masters in their deck? No, sadly not. Um, I, I almost want to try, I'd play enough games to do it as an experiment and just see what happens. Um, I think you'd end up being in the weird spot that you'd have so many reveals that you actually would start losing value on that. But then all you start doing is then playing with Asian actions and just take some super duper strong uh, cards out of the Imperium Arena. You, know, you get hold of like Imperium Ceremony, you get hold of uh Piter, um for example and just take them out the row and just have like these these free reveals um and you just absolutely just just print my source flows and i think you'd be pretty much uncatchable one of the things that's i mean i think this just as as it stands this card's probably needs to either be taken out or at least one of the copies of it should be taken out the fact that there's two is kind of bonkers um but I've just been lucky, like the last dozen or so games I play it, it hasn't come up once except for towards the very end of a recent game. Um, so it's been like I haven't even had to worry about it. Um, I just think the game is better without it. We could talk about it till the cows come home, but I, I don't know. It's hard to find a really experienced player right now who thinks that that the card as it stands is is uh, is a good idea, I think. I mean, I don't want us to like to knee jerk though. Like, this game has only started getting out, um, and some of us have had the opportunity to play it, you know, a bit beforehand. So we've been somewhat fortunate there. Um, and there is obviously a concern of like, you know, it's a knee jerk reaction, um, and that's something that's got to be taken care of certainly. But I think between the lot of us here and our experience, not just with this, but also the the game as a general, we can start seeing these trends appearing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's kind of where we're at here. You know, like I'm I'm happy to you know spend more time making sure you know get more people's opinions. I think it's fine, but I think it's pretty telling that like I, there was two cards that came out and was getting mentioned almost immediately, and one of them was Talaxi Master, especially from people that have played the game a lot and looking at it. And it's, it's again it's weird because like in you know, in a general sort of game, we just kind of casually playing. Like, it's probably not even that big a deal. But when you get hold of it and you know how to cycle through your deck quicker and you get trimmed down and you start getting cards that, like, trash other cards, dissecting kits, you know, guild admins, you just get rid of those little kind of rubbishy sort of cards. Um, you know, you just absolutely fly for it. Or if you're just um, ECAS and you can just do that naturally and then it's a real problem. Yeah, exactly. Problem. Yeah, ECAS as well. Like, ECAS into Axiom Master is, like, absolutely staggering. I think what's really telling is there's a lot, there's been a whole history there's a long list of cards that people feel are the price is too low they're broke and whatever you know web of power and in the shadows and blah like the, the list goes on and every kid debates them back and forth like this card this one card and there's cards like there's other cards like this in in the in mortality expansion that are people are debating back and forth but this one card i i just think there's an emerging consensus yeah. and, and it's and i know what you're saying about knee-jerk reaction but you know we've been playing a fair bit now for for a few weeks and and it's like it's the consensus is getting stronger, I think. So I I don't think this one's going to change. I think we're I think we're going to see this. And, and it was the same in base game when I first joined the online community. It, they kind of had got to that point with Helena. Like Helena was just banned every game, yeah. and yeah. and that's just the way things were. And that consensus eventually emerged. And then when X came out, things got shook it up, and Helena wasn't OP anymore, and Helena was in again. Yeah. And then it was Baron. <laughs> yeah, but Baron's not even not that kind of like unfair i mean he's he's definitely good and it feels a little bit unfair sometimes because he gets so much extra stuff but this is a card imagine baron with this card 
it's just it, it's so unfair <laughs> like the idea that it, it draws you two cards for free when it gets the round to the end of the track and you'll see people racing across the track round three and they're mm-hmm. like all the way to the other end and the other players are like like step two or three and you're like whoa something's wrong like why is this happening and then they're just drawing extra cards for the rest of the game and god forbid they have like you know no uh combat cards in their deck like uh you know the worms or any any like helicopter joes i'm sorry um what's that card actually called uh, uh gun doctor <laughs> you got me calling it that um yeah the if they have those in the in the game but they're buying spice must flows maybe but they're they're winning combats like off of rng in their deck that feels bad that's when it starts to feel like they're not actually playing the game the game's playing itself and that's yeah, where i don't really like cool. that's one of the reasons i don't like this card and we, we've talked about a bunch of other very very um you know powerful cards and i've mentioned in my review of this game on board game geek i'm not of x i'm sorry that i thought that in the shadows was a bit too good and i think it still is a bit too good like i think it's one of the best cards in the game um but one thing i'd say about that card is that it does not draw itself into itself that's the only strength of it or the weakness of it. It does not cause you to draw it more frequently, unless you, of course, go to Research Station, but there's a cost there. So, I mean, that card is very good, and I've even seen busted stuff where people get, like, two of them. Uh, In a recent game, someone got two of them and was, you know, using one to discard the other, and it was like, don't even bother going up the Bene Gesserit track. Like, so, stuff like that was happening. But for this one, it it feels like it's not interactive in the way that the game is not meant to be. Um, and so maybe, maybe I'm wrong there, but it's definitely a problem for me. Um, or so you yeah, haven't yeah. gotten any words in here at, um, about this card at all. Oh yeah. I've got to say when I was going through all the new cards and kind of giving my initial impressions of everything, I kind of forgot that after you get to the end of the research track, every research icon draws new cards. And when I was looking at tell you about play uh, Laxu master, I said it was going to be my favorite card of the game just because the agent reveal box was so interesting to me. And it wasn't something that was as heavily explored in the previous expansions in that this card, when you played it, would allow you to A, acquire a card that costs six or less and then put it directly into your hand if you played enough into the research track. And I thought that was such a fun idea. I think the plays that could get off by maybe grabbing a power play and then immediately playing it that no one else expected. I just thought there'd be all these great moments from this card and to hear that it's more or less just being used to spam out uh, card draws and race through the track, it's a little bit disappointing. Um, I will say the fact that the research icons draw a card at all when you get to the end, it is an interesting design like design decision. I don't think it would have been a huge problem to just say those research icons don't do anything more when you get to the end. I mm. I get that it would probably be have a like bad feeling if you go into a research strategy and now you've reached the end and they don't do anything anymore, but I don't know. It's disappointing because it sounds like the way you're talking about it, that this agent icon isn't really being used as much because if you have to choose between revealing play Laxu master for one persuasion plus two card draws, which is probably on average, like two to three persuasion. Additionally, you're always going to reveal it unless there's something crazy in the row that can give you. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. There could be so many cards. There are six costs that are good. They can just put immediately into your hand and then reveal like, you can get a treachery, which could help you win a combat. You know, it can get um, uh, worm riders, which could help you to combat. It can get you piter, which can buy you a spice must flow. There's all of these, or it can get you another master, which can then draw you two more cards. Like those things are, are really, really, really fundamentally unfair. <laughs> and uh, I also agree with you. It was one of my like, this card seems really fun when I was looking through the cards. I agree with you. Unfortunately, it's not very fun <laughs> for everyone else <laughs> while they watch you do these things. It's um, a shame as well because the agent box—it is cool. It like, is really uh, cool. It, yeah, it is a cool action. There's no doubt about that. But unfortunately, it's just being completely overshadowed. And even if like there's stuff that's fun that you can do of it, like a lot of people are just gonna say, "Eh, I just reveal and just buy some of flow," you know. Mm-hmm. Um, unless there's like specifically something in the row they want to get hold that say like it's a free persuasion, for example, and they'll say, oh, "Okay, we'll get that." And can do something with the action. To be honest, the typically I don't think people are going to use it, which is which is a real real shame. Well, yeah, I, I just want to say I don't. I just want. Oh, so you go ahead, Lancer. No, it's okay. You go ahead. I I'll just very quickly say, I think we're overemphasizing this reveal for cards piece. I mean, 
you do have to get to the end first. You may not have many more. Like we're all kind of assuming you're getting this in round one or something. So I, I think what's powerful that this card is is for me was best encapsulated what, by what Lannister said earlier, where he listed kind of all the different things it gives you: racing mm -hmm. up the research track, or getting up the research track, and the resources that allows the beetle track potentially, or the other things you can do on the research track, and this agent action, which is a way that it does get used. And then there's the reveal for the cards. So I think that's it's all those things put together that makes it an OP card. It's not one part of it, mm -hmm. and that's and it, it has so many different options and so many different things it implies with the research track and the and the Tylaxu, any Tylaxu track and the reveals and the and the action, agent action. It's just so much. That's the, it's all the package of it that makes it an OP card. So uh, going back to what was described uh, about the two uh, Tylaxu masters, I had one game where I did have that. And uh, in my hand was Gola, another forbidden card here, Galaxy Master. So I did play it on the uh, Agent Action instead of for this one because I had two Galaxy Masters. So with regards to this, there were two treacheries on board. Everyone used their atomic so they couldn't blow it up. <laughs> so it was near the last end. Of, it, it became the last round as a result. So <laughs> what ended up happening was I used Galaxy Master to go to the Mentat space with Gola, grab two treacheries. I proceeded to take three alliances and won the combat as well in, in one in one go. That in is what is go. known in the business as a high roll. Yeah, yeah. So that's how busted it was. Yeah. The, the fact that I could take all three alliances, win the combat, reveal for another Talaxu master, get all those for a spice must fall. It was a I think it was a six or seven point round. Holy it was crap! Pretty disgusting. Well, I actually don't hate that as much. I I think that that sounds very like fun and interesting to me. Like obviously, that's not going to be coming up that often. I'd no, imagine in most games you're going to get the I like I don't know. You're obviously going to win the game, but I think those kind of rare like insane combinations. I I actually like that aspect of the new expansion. <laughs> the fact that stuff like that's possible. Now. So, oh, I, I agree. There are way more ways to exploit the the faction tracks, which I I really like. Um, mm -hmm. And this could be a way for us to kind of. Uh, transition. I know we have a lot of thoughts on Flylax and Master. We'll, we'll come. We'll come to some final thoughts toward the end about the expansion um, and the things we might want to do uh, from a tournament perspective in a little bit. But um, let's just transition to some of the other things that have been impacted in, in this game. And one of those things is the more ways to go up influence, more ways to pass opponents from three spaces away on the tracks, two spaces away on the tracks, three. You know ways to really mess with the math love it <laughs> yeah it was something that i i actually didn't really make mention of in the in-depth video it was one thing i didn't quite get round to um grafting is a big reason for a lot of this yeah. um mm -hmm. there's, there's no question about that you know being able to hit faction spaces and then graft cards which also give you faction bumps um, i'm looking at you long reach for example yeah um and stuff like that one thing that's also has always been very uh, like a principle in dune imperium as a whole is that you can't defend against a triple bump it's is basically you can't play against if someone's got a triple bump uh, in their power, whether it's like, um, you know, however they manage it, maybe like Lido goes ring uh, to Interstellar and then catches both of them and then it has like a, a bribery, for example. There's basically nothing you can really do to defend against that. If they've got it, they're just going to take your alliance if you have it and that there's not a lot you can really do. You can't you can't play in advance of that to defend it. You can't think, oh my god, he could triple bump. I've got to get a fourth bump because you need to be spending your time doing other stuff and it just seems completely ridiculous. Uh, but it's definitely is becoming a lot more common in, in uh, immortality. You are seeing significantly more alliances that are getting hit, uh, are getting maxed out to six persuasion to protect. Mm -hmm. um, and there's quite a lot of games I've seen now, a fair portion where by the end of the game, every alliance is maxed out, like within with like a round to spare, um, because people are getting kind of terrified by it. Um, you know, and especially there's so many ways of doing it. You know, even from just weaker cards like Guild Impersonator. Um, to other things again, long reach we've talked about, um, and there's other things for humanity does have that as well as an ability. Uh, even even the sand does. Like there's so many things you can do now. Uh, usurping as well, usurping just like pow a power play from the row. Like what can you do about that? You can't really defend against that sort of thing. Yeah. So um, I can understand why people are getting a lot more terrified about it. Um, is it good though? I mean, maybe. I'm not so sure. I'm with patience on this one. I love it. I love the fact that there's no safety net for you. You gotta, you gotta mm -hmm. go 
all the way through. Like, um, yeah. I guess best case an example of me and two other players had hit each of our own alliances. We basically had the Imperial spacing and Benny, and someone grabbed long reach. As soon as they grabbed long reach, we all just kept jamming our own <laughs> alliance all the way up to the top because we didn't want to give him a chance. That was that was one of the scariest things ever. Like that's you, awesome. You, yeah, it's it's like we had to basically neutralize that card immediately, or else get the risk of just like losing our alliances. It's I love that fear. That fear is what drives this game. I feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and I I mean I and the other the flip side of that is that's not always possible. You know, like and and last night when I was playing the game. I I had uh, like a killer uh, play where I had shifting allegiances to interstellar, um, so it was a three bump move, and I stole the Benny alliance, but I used the other one to tie the Emperor alliance, thinking I want him to waste a move going there because he's afraid I've got something else. I didn't have anything else to take that alliance with, but I was like, I want him to waste a move so I can do these other things I want to do to win this game. So I think it's like the tension that it creates over the alliance tracks. Love it. Like I think it's it's very competitive and makes the game an already cutthroat game even more cutthroat. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I also agree. I kind of I like it. It's a little more dynamic. But I'm I'm a like well known miser in every game I play. I play as low to the ground as possible with as few resources as possible. Um, also as few bumps as needed. And so it makes me cry a little bit, but it's just something I have to adjust to in my play and be a little bit more mindful of um, it being... I mean, something like that, you just mentioned patience, that that was something that could happen in X, right? Totally. I mean, that's not new. Um, it happens sometimes, but uh, I think now with the amount of cards that have extra influence on them, especially with the spacing guild, I've noticed that there are a lot more cards with spacing guild influence, um, or they seem to be, but that makes it a little more interesting. Maybe it's because Guild Impersonator itself is in the Benny Thalaxu deck, and that car, that deck is only like 19 cards, and so you see that a lot, you know. So, so maybe yeah. that's part of the reason. Um, Dude, I, I I've like had it. a game. Sorry, just on this note, on the the Spacing Guild, I've had a game. I had a game. It's a while ago now, so I can't remember exactly how I played it. But I, where I had the three of the new cards all in my deck: the Interstellar Conspiracy which is the graft card with blue with the, the one spice and if grabbed with an emperor or a space and guild card get a, any bump plus it reveals for two only cost four i had guild impersonator which is the one from the tlaxu row it's a graft with the uh, with that symbol but if you gain spice that turn then you get a bump on the space and guild track and then i had the corrupt smuggler which is another mm -hmm. space and guild card plus a yellow uh symbol and if you graft it it gives you two spice so the three of those cards in your hand like it is just I think I was absolute... in that yeah it was wild this man like it was wild <laughs> no no just for anyway. the listeners you can only you can only graft two cards together so what you're saying is that there's there, enough variety of things you could do with the, that hand is what you're saying right there's so many things you could do yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like almost every round or every other round at least, I was getting some combo of those three cards. Fascinating. So yeah. like obviously I took the Spacing Guild alliance, but there was like the spices flowing in, like there's all sorts of and you're getting that other bump with the with the interspell conspiracy because if you're drafting it with an Emperor or a Spacing Guild track card, then which those other two are, then you're getting a, a bump of your choice. So mm -hmm. it's it's those those are that's those two cards, the corrupt smuggler and or those three cards, I guess, are kind of my favorite little combo. You know, they're not OP. They're they're just really fun and dynamic. Right. Those combos. Right. I'm sure Lannister has some stories to tell us about them. <laughs> yeah. um, well, let's let's uh, transition now. I I'm, I appreciate that we talked about that. That's something that's come up as well in the Discord. The sort of inflation in in a sense of um, influence bumps. Um, I think it's fine for the game. I think that that's a fun thing. Also, there's this interesting space on the Bene Tlaxu research board where you can kind of lurk and then like trigger research and then go up a bump, which is really fun. I think that's one of my favorite things about the research board is that there's this, this stray like influence just sitting in the middle of it. You're like, okay. Um, but yeah, that that the play I think around the factions has gotten a lot more fun to me. Um, it does seem to go a little bit faster and sometimes it gets wrapped up by round like five, which feels weird since we're so used to it, you know, by the end of the game, we get to the top sort of thing that changes the dynamic a little bit, but I don't think it's a, in a bad way. I think that it means that you either focus on it or you don't, and you really have to commit. 
Um, but anyway, let's let's transition. There's there's a couple of things I want to talk to. We're already at about an hour and a half, I think, of this this podcast. So I'll try not to go too too much longer. Um, there's there's another card that we haven't talked about that's also been mentioned a couple times. Gola, which is a Benny Tlaxu card with graft, has a blue symbol. It costs three specimens. And its text box says, this card has the same agent box as the other grafted card. So what do you guys think about this card? Um, let's let's throw it out here to Black Shadow. I haven't, haven't talked for a little while. Um, do you like this card? Why, why not? I'm sorry, Paul. I really am. Um, <laughs> I, I, I say this immediately, but unfortunately, it, it's really difficult for me. So... There's a very good card to compare this to, which is technically like its diametric opposition, but also very fascinating. That's the chair dog card, which mm -hmm. you, you play. It's got the same symbols, but if you play it with another card, then that other card becomes part of your reveal turn, which is really cool. Um, I, It's very common, I think, in a lot of card games to see a card that says that you, you combine it with something and then it copies the other action. And thematically, it makes total sense with what the Golas are, um, is lore-wise. You know, it, it, it makes total sense, and I totally get that. But the problem is, that I think, for a game like this, where there are quite a lot of cards, a fair amount of cards that have these exceptionally strong agent boxes, that it just completely spirals. And it spirals to a form where it becomes very difficult to do a whole lot about it sometimes. Um, and there's a lot of cards that this combines, which is just completely absurd. Um, you know, Golo Long Reach, I had in one game. Um, and I managed to get like two hit, I think that was three hits of Golo Long Reach in one game. And it was just <laughs> disgusting. I think at the end of the game, I think I'd maxed three tracks. And the last one, I nearly got that alliance as well. But someone happened to beat me to it with like a treachery and a bribery at the same time. Oh, and I'd had every single alliance in the game. It was absolutely wow. insane. Um, so I don't want to sit here and say that I think Goda's design is lazy. Because I think maybe that's a little bit harsh. But I think for a game like Dune Imperium when you look at some of these agent boxes um, and how some of them, like how strong they are, one of the games, I think its own balance is the fact that you can have these really strong agent boxes, but it's not as big a deal because you only get them once every couple of rounds or so, you know, like it's a real big hitter, mm -hmm. but it, it's, you're not getting much use out of it. You know, even like a long reach, even other cards like that, even from the X game as well, you know, you have to use the card, then you've got to cycle through your deck again and trying to be careful about it to make sure you don't put accidentally to reveal so you can, you can get out again. But Gola just like takes these cards and just ramps up their power so significantly um, that it, it becomes really, really oppressive at times. Um, and there is one that has been doing the rounds, and that is the Gola and Reverend Mother Mahayam, which I'll let someone else take, but I think is, unfortunately, is a an example of where, like, Gola can be fun, and you do a lot of cool stuff with it, but there is the other side where it becomes, like, an absolute nightmare for anyone else in the game. Yeah, I will say I um I actually look forward to this card as well, just for the uh the fun factor. And I think it, a big <laughs> <laughs> I do um I do think another problem with Gola is the fact that it's pretty much always good. Uh, the new experimentation cards they added, which replaced the Dune Desert Planets, which was just the plain triangle access now, um, has an experimentation icon on it and reveals for a specimen. So even if you have no other synergy cards for your deck besides Gola, you can pair it with your experimentation and um, you'll get double research track bumps, which is fine. And it's actually interesting to me that they chose to um, put the, and I guess it's a little off topic, but they chose to put the experimentation aspect of things on the uh, the Dune Desert Planets because it makes, inter I think it makes interstellar shipping even more attractive. But that's, that's just one thing I noticed about Gola is just the fact that it seems like it's always good. There's never a reason not to get it. And... Um, if you do end up getting an even stronger synergy for it, you're just having even more fun with it. So mm -hmm. I think it would have been better if it was if there were opportunities where you kind of get it and it doesn't really work out and it sucks, but it doesn't seem say, like it happens much. I want to quickly throw it out. I think one thing that's interesting about the fact they also still added city icons to Golas. Yeah. Um, I think also is a little curious. Like I would have thought you would have gone all in and just say, um, give it no agent icons at all, much like the... Um, uh, whatever one it is, clandestine meeting, for clandestine example, meeting. and that way, then 
Like, if people, if you've got Gullah in your deck and you've got like one or two power cards, people will know these power cards and they know where they can go. And if it's like a power card, this is really strong, but also has very limited access, then there is a degree of people can try and get in the way of that. Um, so, you know, I'm guessing, and I'm sure they, I'm sure they devs tried different reasons and kind of explorations of this. Um, but yeah, like, especially, like, there are some super duper, absolutely brutal combinations of Gola, um, which again, as a player like, opposing it, there's not really a lot you can do. For me, the, one of the things that I've seen with, uh, lots of things have happened with this card. The things that happen with it, uh, bother me because the, the way the game balances itself out as, is, as you mentioned, these cards that you're getting, you only gonna, you're only gonna see them so often. You have to work hard unless you have a master or something like that, to, to draw into them again. You have to spend resources to draw into them, or you have to call your deck, and you have you have to plan around that. Um, but Gola essentially doubles any card in your deck, so it means that you have two of any card in your deck at a given time. You have Gurney Halleck? Well, you have two. Um, you have Stitched Horror? Well, you have two. Um, that is a problem because the frequency of that happening and then you drawing into a, a decent agent icon card, agent box card, is pretty high. And I'd say like that's when it gets a little bit problematic. We've talked about patience, you, you and I and uh, Black Shed have talked about um, click compression, or not click compression, that's from Netrunner, but uh, agent icon compression or action compression in that, you know, there are a lot of things that you're doing. The more things you're doing in a single action the better. And I think that this really just dials it up to 11 in a way that makes it a little bit hard to justify, you, you know, especially if you're getting Stitch Tor when you're getting like, wow, I'll just get two beetle icons and two troops and I'll just throw all these troops into combat because I went to Carthag and I get my Intrigue card. It's like, holy crap. And it starts to feel a little bit oppressive um, in those moments. Um, I like Graft. I want to, I'll go out of my way and say like, as a defense of Gola, I think Graft isn't necessarily a problem. I think get graft is a really cool mechanism. I really like it. I think that the trade-off of playing two cards to get a good action, but have fewer cards in hand to buy cards is interesting. I think that's a really cool trade-off. Um, but it, it becomes yep. a little bit problematic. When, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I totally agree with that. Yeah. yeah. That it's a, the trade-off is well balanced. Yeah. yeah, I think the trade-off is really awesome. Um, it's it's when you get to maximize the best thing you can do um that that feels a little bit weird um now i know so of between gola and toilaxu master i would rather not play with toilaxu master than gola i think i could maybe see some arguments for it being in the game um it is a really cool card and a really cool thematic thing going on here i mean if you've read the books you know that golas feature prominently into the lore into the uh, expanded universe as well so i i don't want to like say that that's again what black shadow saying this is not me saying like it's really lazy or anything like that it's a it makes sense thematically it just doesn't work in a game like this where your choices of singular cards should matter when you can just pick up gola and say like everything i have is twice as good <laughs> like that's and it's way yeah, too good choice, in the situation as well yeah. i think it's also telling is the fact that if you go into the clarifications in the uh, the manual gola already has this very very pretty extensive for um you know for, for this sort of thing clarifications on what gola can and can't do and the fact that they've already just said that there are several cards that gola just doesn't copy yeah like, um, can you I'll... use gola with quiz arts? no you can't can you use yeah. Gola with Power Player Treachery? No, you can't. What happens so, when you draft Gola to Long Reach? You know, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And and like this is where unfortunately I have to be a little bit, a little bit harsh here potentially. Um, I accept and I've read like on BGG posts from like Paul and whatnot that there are t there there are technical reasons um, in the wording how they're explained to suggest that why these the Gola can't be combined with these cards. Um, this might be wrong and I might misspeak here. It feels to me a little bit that that's kind of a reason um, to actually stop these cards being used because they're just too strong. Because on a day, go and power play, that's four bumps. Yeah. What do you do about that? Nothing. There's absolutely no defense about that. And you could do that you know, on any track whenever you want. And it's just, it's, it's absolutely just... It just completely messes everything. So I think, unfortunately, the fact that there's already um, that much clarification of stuff that it can and can't do, I think is telling for the card design. 
Um, and I'm, that's like exploring some of the other cards as well. We've had we've had several conversations and debates in the Discord, trying to work out how Gola works with some other cards as well, where it's not been very clear how they act, uh, how they work. You know, when you copy a Bene Gesserit card, you know, uh, Mother Maheim is the good example. Like, how does that work? Does it mean you just straight discard four, four cards from everyone else's hands? It's, we don't think it's quite like that, but you just put down like if you've got like any Bene Gesserit card and you play Gola Mother Maheim, everyone else's round is over yeah. on the spot. There is nothing they can do about that, you know, because Mama High can go in and Gola can go in too many places for you to block. So, you know, if in that situation, it's just like, what do you do as a player? And th that just can't be fun because then at that point, you're physically just stopping people playing the game. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's fine having powerful cards as long as other people still have actions in order for you to do something about it. But if you're just, just making them discard their entire hand... Like that, I I don't think that can be good for the game. I, I I just can't see how that's how that's really like beneficial to anyone. I think the key piece of information uh, that was stated there was what Black Shadow said earlier: the the uh, access to city that makes it very accessible there, and it's hard to block. So, for example, Thopter draws you two cards if you have the two spacing guild uh, uh, requirement. But I can easily block that by taking the uh, desert locations. But now all you got to do is pair it up with Gola, go draw five cards. Wow, five cards. And people That's... people do not go to cities early because they want to hit the cities late to get their troops into combat as late as possible, typically, unless you're going mm -hmm. specifically to something or another. So, you know, people are not going to start going to these city spaces just to block Gola. It's just never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You it can't predict too many it. options. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you, you uh, grafted to Piter Genius Advisor, you could lose two troops and draw four cards four and cards. go to research or possibly yeah. six cards if you're already yeah. at the end like whoa okay yeah so two, the two soldiers are pretty easy when you go to air Keen too that's yeah. true yeah and the thing i think that's notable here as well is the fact that that it's easy for us to point out say like a card like gola combining with a card and say it's super powerful and there's always gonna be examples of all the graphs I mean, the problem with Gola is the fact there are so many of them that it all adds up, you know. And again, the Mother Heim thing was an example of like, yes, this is this one situation is completely absurd, but how often are you actually going to see it? Very, very infrequently, you know. It's going to happen so rarely, but there's just so many things Gola can combine that give out like, these oppressive sort of thoughts, and it's just like, what are you meant to do about mm -hmm. it? Um, that it starts getting... Um, they, they, these little, you know, little half percent, you know, these all start adding up. And once you get to sort of like four, five, six, seven, eight percent times that you're going to see this in a game, like it becomes a lot more frequent. And I think that's where this starts to become a problem. Um, and when people just like start dropping all of their plans just to rush specimens if Gola's on uh, suddenly turns up and just to get hold of it, I mean, that probably tells its own story. <laughs> that's another really, really important part of this card is that it's very good. And if everyone knows it's very good, a couple things happen to the Thylax Uro. If it's out there, people will just simply hit water, go to research station, or, you know, hit Arakeen, try to draw into all of your research um, cards as fast as possible. That happens a lot, actually. I've seen that happen several times. <clears throat> um, the second thing that will happen is that no one will buy any cards because they don't want to reveal Gola. I know that happens less frequently because most of the time those cards are good enough that you'll buy them. But, you know, if you have like a From the Tanks and maybe like a Slig Farmer out there, you might not even bother because what if you reveal Gola for the next player and they're, they have the specimens to buy it and then you're in trouble? Like, it, it does feel like that. I'd say that this card is more often used with cards like Stitched Horror or Gurney Halleck or uh, the Thopters things that end up giving you lots of troops or options and things like that and those just doubling are they're good by themselves <laughs> let me just point this out it's like like the stitched horror is a good card by itself but when you double it it feels weird and when you get four troops and two cards from gurney halleck you're just like what and not only that that's not even accounting the, the the space you went to um it does feel like you took like three or four extra actions <laughs> like it really feels like that from the other player's perspective yeah. so. it's the absolute epitome of action compression isn't yeah. it like yeah. what other card like it like emphasizes it more than a graph card that does the exact same thing of the other card yeah. like it's just like it's the absolute top of it 
So, Orski, you haven't said a whole lot about this card. Did you want to mention anything else? Or have you had any uh, experience with this card or seen it played yet? So I actually haven't even played in a game with it, to be honest. A lot of my experience from it has been talking to people about it. Um, I think I was just saying how it. another problem is that it's always good with the ex new, uh, new experimentation cards. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, overall, I... I do like the idea of the crazy combinations. I can definitely see them getting old. And I think another issue is um, when I talk about the fact that, yeah, seeing these crazy combinations are, is is a fun thing to see. When you realize that Gola is in the smaller Tleilax who only deck, you're going to see it a lot more often than you would otherwise. And those crazy OP combos, like you guys were saying, it combines with those a lot more frequently than with a lot more cards. So... Yeah, I think overall, um, definitely a design challenge, and we'll see how the, the community ends up reacting to it. All right, so now we're on to our last segment, and then we're gonna we're gonna move on to just the closing thoughts here. We're going to Highlander, everybody, and in this segment, we're gonna be talking about uh, the topic is our favorite cards. We want to like we've been talking a little bit about some cards that we think are challenging, um, possibly problematic for um, possibly tournament play. I mean, I think all everyone is. Um, welcome to play the game as is, you know, rules as written with all the things. I think that's totally fine. From from my perspective, I'm speaking as a, a person who's interested in the, the com competitive community and, and things like that. Um, but in this segment, I want to talk about your favorite new card from this uh, from this set. What uh, is your favorite thing that you've seen? Um, this could be in combination with a combo or things like that. And let, let's start with Lannister. So you have the most experience of all of us probably twice <laughs> over. Um, so tell us a little bit about your favorite card. My favorite's definitely Talaxi Surgeon. Low cost. It's, uh, I guess you could say it's like a, a firm grip. We all like firm grip because it's equivalent to a, a point per action with two bumps, right? Yeah. Well, you can meet the surgeon. He's a combat-capable firm grip. So it takes roughly eight movements on the BL track to fully capitalize on two VP and two intrigues, which is... Basically, every four movements, you get one point and one intrigue. So this card is giving you two movements every time. So you either get a point, or you get an intrigue, and you get a bump on the Imperial. Or if you don't, if you get blocked the Imperial, you can go on the, the city areas. So it's not as easily uh, neutralized like Firm Grip. If you just go to Wealth, it just gets blocked. It's able to go into combat and get you those points. So if you see this card and you don't take it, you're essentially saying to the opposition, please have two free, free, free victory points on the house. <laughs> it's so it's it's so ridiculous. Like uh, essentially it's three to three to buy and it get, it has access to city and has access to the Imperial track. I think you mean Emperor, the Emperor track. Yes, Emperor track. Okay. So uh, when you play it, you can give up two of the uh, the cubes and the two cubes will give you two bumps on the scarab or Specimen cubes, track. right? Was, specimen cubes, right? Uh, specimen cubes. Specimen yeah. cubes. Yep. So, those two movements are pretty easy to achieve. You just reveal two of those uh, experimentation cards, and that's good enough. Or you go research, or any number of combination of things. So those resources are very easy to come by. So when you see this card and you don't take it, it's two VPs on the house. And just as an example, um, when I was playing a game, when I had that card, turn one. By the time I hit the end of the track, everybody that was going for the track was maybe at three. <laughs> three bumps on the Beetle track by the time I hit eight. It's it's impossible to deal with. And even as a late game card, it's still two by power. So it's a ridiculous card in my opinion. That's a good one. Oh, I really like that card. Yep. Patience? Yeah. Um so I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit different here. I think what I like is in in picking up on what I said earlier about the interstellar conspiracy, corrupt smuggler, and um, and the uh, whatever it's called there, guild impersonator. Uh, the, yeah, guild impersonator combo. What I what I something I've noticed is there's enough new ways from cards, from agent actions and reveal actions, and a couple new intrigues to get spice. Mm -hmm. So there's still suit manufacturers reveal for two spice with a firm bond. There's Liz Lizan Al Gaib buy it for four get a spice when you buy it. There's the keys to power, which is if you have two influence on your agent, 
action uh, you get two spice and then there's there's your experimentation cards which are leading people to go to the mining for spice more often as well I'm just noticing I like overall that there's more spice in the game there's I think there's more highliners happening but there's also the potential of more tech I, I just like that whole it's it's not something that's been talked about a lot but I really like this this enriching the spice without overwhelming it's not like it's just free flowing and anybody can get it any time but when some of these cards are in the game and I I, I I like that that's that's my thing shadow so i want to make an honorable mention to beguarding pheromones which i've had a lot of fun i think it was a game actually i think with lannister where i sent it with a dagger as a dispatch envoy to defend an alliance and then trashed it that was really fun um so i think we were i think you were in that game uh yeah he uh destroyed me in turn six so yeah, yeah. It, it, oh, it, was, still, it, was, it was yes it was the yes turn six. i okay, still yeah. remember it oh god i still I have was, nightmares about that I'm, game i mean yeah it was i mean <laughs> i i, I I, I, it's probably one of the best games of Dune Premium I've ever played in my life. So, you know, it's the way it goes sometimes. Um, but yeah, so Honor Mentor with Beguiling Pheromones. But for me, I've had a lot of fun with Steel Suit Manufacturer. Um, I really like it as a concept of a card in the fact that um, it has so many different uses um, and also encourages you to aggressively go after factions, um, which I think is super awesome. Mm -hmm. um, the image will be on the screen. Um, but yeah, throwing access, city access means obviously you're going to go down to a combat route, which people who have played the games will know that I'm generally not far away from getting involved in fights. Um, you generate water by playing him, um, but also the fact if you have the front alliance, you can play the card and then put it back in your hand, which is absolute. It is just great entertainment because you just, you know, you can then reveal it for like the reveal and the fremen bond if you've gone down that route, which you probably should do. Or you could play the card again. Um, I had one game I, I played, which was um, which was pretty amusing. Uh, I know we talked about it a little bit, but I did have a game where I paired uh, Steel Seat Manufacturer with Gola with a locked-in Fremen Alliance. Um, and I literally would go... You'd go to Research Station, play both cards. The two what you spend, you get back for free. You know, you get it straight back. You get both cards back in your hand, and you just and you just have like, this enormous deck. I think I did it twice to there, and then I went to Arakeen. I had like 11 cards in my hand or something by the end of it. Holy and crap. And I hadn't actually technically put an agent card down. It was completely just, it was absurd. Like, it didn't really help me much in the end of the day. Um, you know, it looked good. It was absurd having these agents down and just like to end these cards straight back in my hand. It was really, really strange. Um, but, uh, you know, I still think Steel Suit on its own is still a very, very capable card. And I think just the fact that, you know, the fact that water, it gives you water means obviously you can hit like a Hardy Warriors for free without any water penalty, which is so huge. Any card that lets you do something like that or any way like you know like when you have like three bumps on the fremen track and you know that you can hit the fourth one going hardy warriors and get your water back is monstrous any combat where like first like desert power for example where the top two give you water back like hardy warriors is just so good because you're not actually like the, the normal penalty for going hardy warriors is basically ignored because you're getting it back in some mm. form or another like if you go hardy warriors and you don't get the top two positions in desert power like something has gone absurdly wrong so um, yeah, still sit manager for me, like is really cool. You can let the obviously then return it, reveal it, which is kinda like almost like it's it's almost like its own chair dog as well, if you can return the card. But then you can decide you can play it again if you want, uh, and just generate tons of water. So really cool, really versatile. Um you can do all sorts of fun with it. It's it's pretty good. I wouldn't say it's it's absolutely busted or anything like that. Like you've still got to get that Fremen Alliance in order to uh, ensure it. And there was one game I played um where so i think uh, it was uh where cj was actually watching over it in the gm spot and someone had steel suit manufacturer i think it was a baron yeah. and i just absolutely bombed the fremen track just completely just to stop yeah. being able to use it very much because i knew what it could do i was like i'm not letting this i just absolutely bombed the track with just everything I, every time i go there i just hit it just because i know that I, I know it's dangerous because i've been there before so um, so I think that's probably my pick of the lot. So but there's there's a lot of fun cards. That's really cool. I, I love cards like that. And I know patients probably echo this, like uh, y'all might too. Is that cards that like uh, cause other players to react in particular ways. Like they cause you to change what you're doing in order to prevent someone from doing something that's very powerful. Like that to me feels like Dune to me. That, that that's That's what I love about this game. It's like those moments where you go like, oh my God, I need to, I need to protect this. I need to get up there or this could get out of hand. You know, it's the same thing with like uh, Firm Grip. We used to talk about Firm Grip, like one of the better cards, probably one of the best cards in the original base game. 
you know, two bumps, you pay two Solari to do it, you know, basically you the, the one bump from the wealth or whatever, and then somewhere else. A card also reveals for four persuasion if you have it in hand and you have the Emperor Alliance. But so infrequently does that ever happen because somebody will take it away from you. No one lets you get that. Um, yeah. the, the, the classic example is uh, Guild Chief Admin. Yes. Which gives it for the for the spacing guild. That's the classic example of where people will try and just like bomb the track to stop you doing it because that's the one that gets hit first. So it's usually one that gets um like uh, pursued by other players to stop you playing. Especially in like the original Dune, that would happen so much. Like people would start bombing fold space just to try and prevent you getting it and just hope you don't have like shifting allegiances on because it was, yeah. You know, and then they're forcing you to play the card to defend your own right. alliance so that you're not getting the paying the spice for the victory points stuff like that. Anyway, I think that's fun stuff. I really like cards like that. That's a good choice. Orski. Okay, so my favorite card. So far, and I actually haven't even played with it yet, but it's similar. I kind of talked about why I really like the idea of Tleilaxu Master, and it's going to be Usurp. Oh, yeah. It's one of the new Tleilaxu Row cards. It costs four specimens, and it reads, you may graft this card to a card in the Imperium Row without acquiring it. If you do, trash that card at the end of your turn, and it reveals for one Persuasion, one Dagger, and one Specimen Icon. And I just really like the idea of being able to surprise your opponents, and if people are keeping track of the cards that you're putting in your deck... A to some degree of confidence, they can expect plays from you. You know, you're not, if you haven't picked up any power plays or any other big uh, influence cards, you're not going to be able to sneak an alliance away from them. If you don't have a uh, Choam Delicate, you're not going to be able to go into Interstellar Shipping if you don't have any other uh, infiltration cards. And Usurp opens up the door to very surprising plays. And it gives you an additional way to interact with the Imperium Row, mm -hmm. in addition to the Atomics and everything like that. And if you're playing against someone that you saw get usurped, this is kind of just another interesting interaction where you see a treachery in the row and you really don't want that to be um, grafted to usurp so the person doesn't get two bumps out of it. Now you can use your family atomics and you have a way to uh, counterplay that if you haven't already used it earlier in the game. So I, I'm most excited to play with usurp. I think it's going to be a really fun card. I don't think it's especially overpowered, especially costing four icons, but that's where I'm at. Yeah, I I like this card a lot too. I'm I'm glad you chose it because it's it's like the top end of the what what I imagine would be the top end of the Bene Tleilaxu cards, the experimentation cards. Like its effect is so unique and so interesting, but it costs four specimens. That's 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 a pretty big investment, honestly. Like three is like manageable, but four takes a while. Um, but it's really cool yeah it's it's a really cool card it can also be kind of miserable too if like the row isn't cooperating it could be kind of a, a dud um so it, it has like play to it and i like that i really like this card good choice um i, I must add something i just want to put on my pool of Trades hat here um put it on i think usurp is an absolutely staggeringly amazing card for pool uh, especially if you have ways of no, no, there's his ways of drawing like his top cards of his deck, and also like if you have something like Hollow Projectors, for example, and you can cycle into your deck whenever you want if you know it's your top card. Usurp basically lets you know, even without it being in your hand, you basically have like a 10, 11, effectively like 11 different cards in your hand because mm -hmm. you can just draw into it as your top card and then play Usurp on anything on the Imperium row if you so see fit. It's absolutely, it is just so fun and it's so like impressive what you can do with it it's the absolute like epitome of just flexible gameplay um and it's also great with pull because of course then if you, you don't the one scary thing with getting cards that usurp for example is you're scared that you're going to draw into it like towards the back of a round on your last agent action and then it's revealed and it's like ah it feels really bad especially when you put such a heavy investment so i, I honestly reckon usurp in pool's hands is like one i think it might be one of his best cards in the entire game um and i, I honestly believe that i've used it a few times um, and just you just have so many options at your disposal. It, it can make you just so difficult to be played against because people know that you can do almost anything at any time, and it it definitely has a knock on effect. So so that's I think that's a great card. I I love it. Um, I'm glad that you you like it with Paul. I I haven't played enough Paul lately with his user, but um, Play that more makes sense. Paul. It makes Play sense. More Paul. No. <laughs> I've been trying out Ariana to see if. Uh, if what I've I've heard is true and that she's better than before, I'd say that she is if you can get Tile Exu Master. Um, okay, so my card is a little bit different. Um, I'm actually gonna go. I, I've been 
waffling back and forth since we've been talking about this, and there's a lot of cards that I really, really like from this set that are really interesting. Um, my, I want to do an honorable mention, um, and it's uh, to Tlylaxu Infiltrator. Um, first of all, it's, this card is very, very powerful. It's a two-cost specimen um, graft with a blue icon. It says, enemy agents don't block your agent this turn. It draws you a card, and if you're all the way at the end of the research track, it also draws you an intrigue card. Uh, this card is just really good. <laughs> like, it's just amazingly good. Um, not being blocked anywhere, and if you graft it to something, uh, wh whatever, you know, whatever you graft it to is unblockable. That is very powerful. But that's that's my honorable mention card. So I, I think that that's a fun card. And But the card I really want to mention here is actually um, one that Lannister turned me on to uh, in only only in certain situations. I'm actually going to talk about Corino Jeans. I think Corino Jeans is a really interesting card. It's the only card in the game that when you buy it, it gives you Solari, which is fascinating. It has one Emperor icon, and then it has an agent box that says, if grafted, you get a beetle. It reveals for one persuasion. And it, of course, costs something, but it costs only one um, one of the specimens. So, and the reason I, I want to say that this this card is really interesting to me is, Lannister told me about this sort of strategy with, with Leto, and because Leto can buy Dreadnoughts for two, this card funds Leto's Dreadnought addiction. And it gets you there really fast. Um, and it lets you do pretty nuts things if you end up going to wealth, buying a Carino Jeans, um, at the end of going wealth, hitting up a dreadnought, buying Carino jeans, which finds another one, and then you can throw both of them in with your last action on round two. That's really fun. I think that 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 opened my eyes a little bit to how Leto can play, and I I always knew he could buy uh, dreadnoughts cheaper, but this really kind of like like changed the way I might pick um, leaders. And, and this goes back to that, that, that what I was talking about with regard to Atomics, that because the Bene Tleilaxu deck can't be Atomixed, you can play to this card. You don't have to worry about that happening, about it getting wiped and then drawing new cards. The only thing you worry about is someone else picking it, um, which could happen. But, I mean, man, that is really cool. It's a really fun strategy to play towards. So that's, that's my pick. So, so that's it for us today. I think that the uh, we're gonna go. Uh, the only thing I want to say, like after all of this, what are y'all impressions? Um, positive. Uh, you know, there's a little bit. Of, we were we've been pretty critical here, but I'd say like you know, this is all from a place of uh, care, and we we really love this game. Um, we don't want. Uh, we 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 I think we fairly say like we don't want busted stuff in the game that that makes people not have fun, right? We want the game to have enough legs and um and complexity and repeat plays that we keep coming back to this and finding new things like we have been right um so just some final words uh let's start out with patience what are your final thoughts on on immortality yeah i'm i'm 100 in uh i think it's really simple like we talked a lot about goal we talked a lot about telaxer master i say just call those cards and i love it and I'm cool with them because they're not going to be in every game, but I think that's really the only issues I have. I, I think it's fantastic. I'm amazed by how tight they've been able to keep the game while adding so much to it. Like that is masterful game design as far as I'm concerned. Love it. Yeah. Uh, as, as I think overall, my, I think the pros for Immortality is far outweigh the cons. Um, I think there are some definite discussions we had closer to in Immortality Tourney to a couple of things. And I, I think it's fine as speaking to the the wider Discord community here. Like, there's obviously been tons of conversation about it, um, and I think the conversation is fine. It's, it's similar to like when people sort of talk about like house rules to certain things, they'd adjust to it. I think the, the conversation is totally fine because it's interesting to see how many different people kind of think about the game and approach the game and how they feel about certain things. But we haven't even talked at all in this in this one about like dreadnoughts and how they have seen like this massive revival from Rides of X where they're a bit you know spurious sometimes and in, in immortality they've got this new lease of life now which is really awesome to see um you know which we'll get to in a future time i'm sure so yeah. um yeah i think on the whole immortality, they've done a very good job um 
There are a couple of things, though, that are probably going to need like a serious look at uh, for a more competitive style sort of gameplay. But that's that's a problem for another time. I've got I've got another tournament to sort out before that, um, so <laughs> I think that's going to take my prize. You're busy. Okay. Yes, I'm a, I'm a busy man at the moment. The past few days have been pretty nuts. I've basically been Dune Imperium project manager over here. Yeah. So thanks a lot uh, for that, yeah. by the way. I really love that uh, you're organizing it again. 160 entries in 67 hours. That's disgusting. completely yeah. ridiculous. And I've already got like 20 reserves at time recording. It's That's awesome. We're going to have to do something about this, kids. I, I mean, this, <laughs> this is. Uh, I, I can't just keep counting. I'm running out of letters. I've already got 20. Like, what do I do beyond Z? What do you want me to do, kids? You know, Double group a. exclamation mark, group <laughs> hashtag. Like, I mean, I've got to do something about this. Yeah, I absolutely love the uh, new expansion so far. I don't think I've played enough to get jaded by some of the new cards, so they're all really new and exciting to me. I think Family Atomics is great, and I look forward to playing a lot of new games. Um, just to mirror what um, I believe it was what Patience said, is it is surprising that they were able to fit so much in without bloating out the game and making it kind of unmanageable or unwieldy to uh, like lesser, I don't know, like more casual players. And I... I think overall super happy with this expansion and uh, excited to see where it goes but uh, yeah i uh i played 200 games of this because i hate it so what can I say? <laughs> do you that or you hate yourself you? <laughs> yeah yeah one or the other no i i absolutely love this game it's, it's the best i i i've never been so addicted in my life i seriously have a problem here so somebody help me somebody help me i mean we can try but i i, I other than like solitary confinement i think even then you'd just be playing like doom games in your head with like other <laughs> egos. probably on right. the ceiling on the ceiling like oh, yeah. uh queen's gambit like like queen's gambit, <laughs> queen's gambit. <laughs> must get my spice must flow emperor's gambit there we go awesome yeah my thoughts on it echo all of y'all's th thoughts on my basically um, I am fine with Atomics playing with it. And I'm less fine with playing with Tylaxo Master and Gola. I will humor people if they have not played too many games and they just want to experiment with things and play and do things, those sorts of fun things. But man, do I groan and complain when I, I see someone pick up a Tylaxo Master round one. And this has happened, and I played you know 25 games. I've seen this happen three or four times. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to play through this whole game <laughs> like i know you're going to do very well you're going to sail up the track and i can't do anything about it it's sort of things bother me but um i'm a little bit over critical at times um that said i think that this is an awesome expansion i love the research board i think it is super interesting i know some people said it's like a little bland some of the things in the middle but if you like if you think about the choices like going for an extra specimen or a beetle, those are actually pretty interesting choices. Like, do you try to push for an intrigue card earlier or are you trying to like reveal and buy something else? Or are you trying to get extra troops or what? Like those choices are not easy. And I think that the leader picks um, that you, you know, when you initially choose your leader, you can kind of plot out your course through that track and see if you really need to, you know, call cards from your deck maybe you're naturally not very good at calling cards and you try to hit up those calling card spots or maybe you're trying to play for um different influence spots so you're like trying to hop and down to the bottom and then hit that that uh influence spot or you really want to hit that trash and intrigue card to draw a card and an intrigue card like there's so many interesting choices i think on that track um and i just keep seeing new and interesting plays from players very very um innovative plays that surprise me when using that track i kind of forget sometimes when i'm playing that i'm you know i'm so focused on the board or combat or something else that i forget sometimes about it and i think that that's one of the things i'm learning and i, I like relearning when i play this game is that there's so many things to discover and and keep getting better at so well thank you for all for listening uh and to all of our wonderful guests the black shadow orski patience and lannister thank you for being here we'll try to do this again soon We'll see you next time.